let me uh, mention a few ideas which are not directly about the course, but about our today's time. We are living in a dangerous times which are still governed by dark forces of dark ages of the past. Very often we believe that the spring is here to stay to find out that the cold winter is probably the permanent state of great majority of mankind. It is a luxury for us to come here and talk about topics for which probably we could be sentenced to death for heresy yeah. and blasphemy. We are fortunate that we can appeal here in our location to unbiased human reason, which has to be sheltered by our hands, just like a candle flame exposed to drafts from all possible directions. Thinking hurts, you know, as I very often say, and it has to be protected. And to protect it, there is no authority which can officially protect it, because authorities usually protect their own interests, not the interests of human reason. The major thesis of this course is emergence of Eureka. Eureka is a Greek word which was in this very context used by Archimedes when he was taking a bath. Archimedes is probably the greatest physicist of ancient times. When he was enjoying his bath, he noticed that the water was rising according to his body, volume of his body. Being a physicist, he noticed the difference. An average man probably enjoys the bath and doesn't pay attention, you know, to the amount of water. He figured out that his body displaced amount of water which must be equivalent of his body. Of course, he, he made, I think, few mistakes. In order to figure out that the amount of body displacing itself, for that reason, he has to submerge completely. <laughs> he still had his head above, above the water. So he did not have a complete content of his body. But we excuse his mistake. It was a great thought he had which he applied in various other cases in Sicily where he was serving his king. As soon as he noticed the difference, and keep in mind, he was naked, he jumped out of the tub and, and started running and shouting, Eureka, Eureka. <laughs> I found it, I found it, I, I found it, all excited. And so he was running naked, you know. <laughs> Average people thought that he was crazy, you know. <laughs> but it happened many times in his story when somebody <laughs> who shouted Eureka after him was regarded as crazy. So this is the uh, proverbial story of Archimedes and his Eureka. What it was, he just described 
the suddenness of an idea he had, which occurred in his mind, and he could not keep it for himself. He tried to communicate it to other people. And this is, in principle, you know, what Eureka is. Uh, very few people uh, try to dig into it, you know. What is this Eureka? Where is this coming from? Many other people had Eurekas. They didn't know the word, but they had that what goes into it. The suddenness of emergence of idea is a great source of human creativity. It is an act of creation. And as everything in human history, it was used as and misused, more misused than used. It is a call to something unknown. Before Archimedes and after him, there were many people who had exactly the same. Only the quality of the insight is different. Any fool can have Eureka. And it is difficult, you know, to call him a fool. Eurekas have to be tested. It cannot be announced you know, to the world, expecting that the world will embrace it. You know. All fanatics had Eurekas, and they have them still. They are very dangerous for survival of humanity. So the basic thesis of Eureka I am going to discuss is that this sudden something what happens changes our mind. What is mind is another mystery. You know, we cannot describe it from medical point of view, from psychological point of view. We describe it, of course, but something is missing. So in our description and of Eureka, a lot of will be missing. We are trying to put finger on something what is mysterious in human nature. The very thesis of our course is, and I have to emphasize, against predominant belief of human history, which was governed by two very strong beliefs. These two great beliefs can be described as deduction and induction. Deduction is a process of our thinking, and it emerged the moment when ancient Greeks started thinking about thinking, about their own thinking, and discovered that there are certain patterns. They invented, and it was Aristotle, who invented a process of thought which is known as deductive logic. Deduction, in principle, consists of statements from which you can deduce something else. It is like big cow you can milk. So the cow is here giving milk, and you can just milk her. So the process of deduction is that we are in possession of tremendous tool when we can milk. But from where? Where is the cow? Where is the cow in our mind? Where is the cow as such? So the man, it was Aristotle and many outstanding people who embraced this explanation, 
declared that we have to start from something what is absolutely certain. If we are in possession of something what is certain, we can start milking from it. So we have to declare that there is something certain, absolutely certain. And this is what emerged out of this process of thinking, deductive thinking. It affected all religions. All religious thinking is deductive thinking. It needs a source. You accept how and hear the role of Eureka. Somebody will come and tell you, I had Eureka. But I did not figure out my Eureka. It came from outside. I milked it from outside. I was invited for a private session. And I was given this message. And the audience is, wow. Oh. And, and they keep, they got the message. You see, deduction works in everything human mind has invented, believing that we need this certain source. So if you believe that there is a certain source, you start deducing when you tell me, Nancy, you know, I know I, I had that that, that that connection, you know, with somebody last night. And since you are my friend, I believe you, you know. Oh, good. And, and this is how it goes, and then I will convince all of you that it is the case. And you desire to have something certain, absolutely certain. This is another aspect of human nature, striving for certainty. So it is satisfied. <clears throat> Aristotle gave us a pattern which he called logic. He established laws of logic. These laws of logic are so clear, self-evident, that you would never dare to argue with it. The first law, law with capital L, you know, was law of identity. What is, is. What is not, is not. Clear? Is there anybody who dares to object? <laughs> <laughs> and don't tell me that you always knew that. You see how clear this thing, self-evident it is? What is, is. What is not, is not. And because of this first law, Second law is law of contradiction. Is and not is cannot be. Again, you tell me, don't tell me anything new. I always knew that. You see, you confirm Aristotle, you know, that second law is really something as part of us. Is there anybody who has objections to it? to second law. I see you agree. Now, because of you accepted already first law and second law, the third law is either or, excluded middle. Nothing in the middle can be. It is either is or is not. You cannot put anything in between. You see how it follows? Mm. This is 4th century BC. He formulated it, and m the minds which were thinking figured out it cannot be otherwise. It can be only as Aristotle says. This very system mesmerized the whole Western mind, Western education, 
programmed our Western humanity. In order to think, you will think this way. The great masters of this way of thinking were scholastic philosophers, theologians, who preserved the tradition of Aristotle in monasteries and prepared it to be distributed for all members of the church and through church uh, it became the official system of our thinking. The doctrine he invented was doctrine of syllogism, which is kind of backbone, kind of exercise of three sentences. Three sentences are two premises, and the third one is conclusion, which is pulled out of the premises. Classical example during the time of antiquity was all men are equal. Socrates is a man, therefore, conclusion, Socrates is woman. I, you know, I, I, I got lost in my life. <laughs> All men are mortals. Socrates is a man, <laughs> therefore, Socrates is mortal. Yeah. I have forgotten a lot of Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is the backbone. You see how conclusion has to follow. And this is the way of thinking our Western culture and society accepted and believed in. <clears throat> it was believed that the reason operates using these three laws. It never occurred to anybody, and nobody would dare to object to it. You know, good students learn things by heart, because it will be on the finals. They can throw it back, and they get an A. For 3,000 years, we had good students. There were only very few misfits you know, who disagreed, you know, with little things. But it was not easy. They were regarded, you know, as, as heretics, uneducated, could not get a job, because they objected to this general belief that this is how educated mind operates. So, in religion, in science, and now, in mathematics, how, how it works in mathematics. You know, mathematics is not a name. Usually when you hear mathematics, many people start shaking, you know. <laughs> and mathematics is a way of thinking. <coughs> and this way of thinking is thinking of man at that time when Aristotle lived approximately uh, with his age is the age of uh, Euclid. Euclid, the great inventor of geometry, which uh, received the name Euclidean geometry. Since he lived at the same time, he accepted the way of thinking of his age deductive way of thinking. Now, in mathematics, you operate with sen sentences. So, in order to state something, you need some superior sentences, sentences which are clear, distinct, self-evident. Hooray! If I can get them. Yes. They are axioms. Axioms are defined, clear, distinct, self-evident. You see, we are back, you know, with our belief there must be something clear, distinct, self-evident. So if we have mathematical base consisting of something clear, distinct, self-evident, we can start milking the rest. 
for 3,000 years, there will be people who will try to get an A, and they will repeat everything what was stated by Euclid and his followers. To be a good student, you have to be a parakeet. And our Western humanity produced armies of parakeets. Again, when somebody came and offered something else, he was regarded as a misfit. What would be your objection here when you, I'm telling you, this is what everybody believes. Would you dare to, to say something against what everybody believes? Probably you would go with the crowd. <laughs> Oh, you have to have an idea you will use to disagree with it. How do you get an idea when everybody believes in what I have just described? It is Eureka. Now, all of a sudden, you have a Eureka. Maybe those things which are clear, distinct, self-evident are not clear, distinct, self-evident. But I should not shout it, because people are hearing. Oh, what about if all of these axioms, what about if they are assumptions? That's a Eureka. But you will tell me, I have never heard anything like this. What do you dare to? To, are you going to teach it? You won't get a job to teach it. Everybody knows that axioms are clear, distinct, self-evident truth. And you are saying there are assumptions. Are you aware of what, exactly what you are thinking? Assumptions are assumptions of man who assumes. Today, 10 minutes later, he assumes something else. Tomorrow, I discard my assumption. I replace them with some other assumption. My God, what happened with all of our learning? It cannot be the case. It happened in the field of, of mathematics, where brilliant people, one of them, he was priest. His name was Sacheri, Italian priest Sacheri in the 17th century. <coughs> he had serious doubts. He had Eureka. That the problem was with fifth postulate in Euclidean geometry. You know, fifth postulate stays and formulated by Euclid through a point next to a line, there can be one and only one line drawn which is parallel with this line, and these two lines can never meet. And students who try to get an A during the history repeated it. Sacheri is one of the first ones, followed by others who had serious doubts about it. 200 years later, there is a brilliant, one of the greatest mathematicians of Western history, Professor Gauss. Oh. He probably would not like a, a, a red, red color on him. And Gauss, in 19th century one of the most brilliant mathematicians, German mathematician, who himself was afraid to announce it, that axioms could be changed. So what do you do when you are a professor who wants to keep his tenure and good salary? peace at home, uh, 
And you have this Eureka, which is pushing you, you know. Said, My God, this, would I have to do something with this? So I will find some students, and I said, Nancy, this is the case. Okay. It can be different. <laughs> yeah, these parallel lines can meet, but we have to assume something else about the parallel line. What is a line? We can control a line only up to the ceiling. You know, we don't know what happens above the ceiling with the line. I can assume, you know, that there are some powers, some devils, you know, who are moving, you know, the lines. I can, don't I have a right to assume it? That there are lines which can meet. Oh, there are no lines. Of course not. Students listening to Professor Gauss. There was a Russian student, Lobachevsky, Hungarian student, Bolai, and German student, Riemann. They just assumed different things about these parallel lines and produced three different geometries. So we have and there was an assumption that Euclidean geometry is about the world. It is directly jumping from the world into our mind. So now you have four geometries. Three students of Professor Gauss, Bolai, Lobachevsky, Riemann, formulate different geometry. <laughs> Implication. If you have a triangle like this, you know, some total of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So in this kind of triangle, it will be less than 180 degrees. If you have an obese triangle, like many of our people are, <laughs> so you have the triangle you know, which is more than 180 degrees. You see what is the result of different assumptions. So the basis of mathematics are assumptions, human assumptions. It destroys a great myth, you know, which we have had about possibility of milking deductively something from s certainty. Now the question is, can we live without certainty? Can mankind live without, without certainty? Look what's going on in today's world. Not only globally, globally but domestically too. Can mankind live without certainty? The majority cannot. And they will be led into things which are, you are observing every day in our today's life. So those who made this tremendous progress were not accepted because the majority of the crowd did not want to accept it. It takes time, but it does not affect mobs, masses of people, because they are being served by this clear theory of deduction and claim that they have direct con content from outside which you are receiving because you are striving for certainty. You know, in 20th century, we had a, a great German physicist, Heisenberg, <coughs> who formulated for the first time principle of uncertainty, Heisenberg.
<coughs> I was fortunate to be in his seminar during the 50s. We had many very interesting discussions. He's one of the founders of quantum physics, uh, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so, the, but it could be another course, you know, just a <laughs> conversation with Heisenberg and pleasant and, uh, and some very unpleasant, you know. And, but he was a great man. Principle of uncertainty. We can never know what is happening, you know, in subatomic world. We are limited by human uncertainty. Of course, this applies to everything else. But don't dare to bring it out of his classroom if you don't want to be accused of blasphemy. <laughs> we are living in a society which is striving for certainty. And life without certainty is for most people difficult to imagine. And we have to take it and or figure out some eurekas how to change people, how to change these masses of people who are destroying our consulates, killing our ambassadors. How? Some drugs, some, or how could we change these people? This is middle age behavior. So, so this is the, the story of Eureka in didactive form, you know. Greatest minds, you know, were shining, you know, this tool of deduction in all fields of human thinking in the West. Let me interject immediately that there was a part of the world at that time of Euclid, Aristotle, and all these great Western thinkers which never believed that this is the case. You know, I can, I, I can simply... <coughs> this dualistic world of the West we live in is one, two. There are two worlds. What is, is. What is not, is not. These two worlds cannot be either or. This is the way of thinking we have adopted. There was Chinese way of thinking, which did not have this kind of pattern. You know, you know, they have the pattern. of complementarity. So everything is few, fused together. So you have to exclude, exclude in middle in order to accept that. Yeah. So uh, Taoist way of thinking in China never accepted two worlds which are in fight. They are integrated one into another. Out of that, they produce completely different way of thinking. Now, when at the beginning of 20th century, when a group of young physicists were coming together in Copenhagen under leadership of uh, Professor uh, Gauss, or oh, Professor uh, Bohr. Uh, Bohr. 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 He was not Bohr, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, Niels Bohr, you know. Uh, and his colleague was Heisenberg. They were working on completely new physics which departed from the classical physics of Isaac Newton. 
it was quantum mechanics. And it was Bohr who introduced a new principle into description of subatomic phenomena. When it is difficult, you know, to fix what is particle, what is wave, you know. In our Western way of thinking, dualistic way of thinking, it is either or, particle or wave. And Bohr is the first one who says, I, I cannot state what it is. We don't understand this world. We can guess only, but there is something wrong with the way of thinking we are introducing into the world of thought in the subatomic world. We are stalpering ourselves, our own thinking. You know, when we are penetrating, we are encountering ourselves with a mirror, you know. He introduced concept of complementarity. Concept of complementarity, which he learned later that it is similar to this way of thinking. He said, what? Taoist? In China? Off I go to China. He went to China. He said, how, I deduce it from I study of quantum world. He went to China and was introduced into, but he independently had Eureka. His Eureka was Eureka of excluded middle. Third law of Aristotle, out. How to present it to our public? You see, we are mesmerized by our tradition, and uh, you know it is, you get nervous when somebody thinks, eat or, tell me, eat or. And Bohr says both. It is a, one of the radical revolution. We changed our mind. Eureka, we changed our mind. Mm -hmm thus changing the world we live in. But probably for one, two percent of people, 98 percent, maybe 95, they are the voters. What can you do with one person, two person? <coughs> it will take time. So we are optimists that in due time it will change the minds. But how? This happened at the beginning of 20th century, more than 100 years ago. I doubt we are teaching it in our Western system of education, emphasizing it that it is a great achievement of human mind. In my experience, 50 years of teaching, I can say we never emphasize it as a great achievement of human mind, which has implications. If you once digest it, what it means. You see the world differently. And this is something we have to wait probably for centuries before it starts changing the minds of the masses. So this is deduction. The other emerged later on and was always known, you know, called induction. So we have deductive logic, inductive logic. 
inductive logic was known to Aristotle. He worked on it too, but it was not, rega not regarded as glorious. Inductive logic is collection. You are a collector. You are like you are looking for mushrooms, you know, and, and you are a collector of mushrooms. Bring them home and compare them. Oh, this is a big mushroom. This is, oh, this is edible. Oh, I have stomach ache. This is not edible. So you start comparing. Inductive logic is a result of five senses. Five senses are collectors. Oh, he's singing quite well. You know. You know. What I see, I can hardly believe, but it is a very nice mushroom. It tastes good. And he said, no, I cannot stand it. What's wrong with your taste? <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't hear what you say. I, I don't, I don't, I don't hear. Maybe I need a new battery. <laughs> the world is back here, I hear. You see? So, let's trust our senses. Aristotle himself uh, did not regard it so powerful as deductive logic, you know, where the the, uh, the reason marched in Prussian boots, you know, and <laughs> it was so and so, it had to be so, no excuse, you know, no. You had to accept a conclusion, you know, when it is correctly drawn from premises. But inductive logic, depending on senses, and our senses are not the best ones, you don't have to trust them. But they are collectors, so we will collect, and we will collect and generalize. The problem is with generalization of inductive finding. Why? You can never collect everything. You can collect 100 mushrooms and say they are edible. You cannot collect all mushrooms. You cannot collect people, all people, that they are mortal. You cannot say in inductive logic, all men are mortals. You can say, if you are careful, up to now, all people who were born lived, died. It is highly probable if I am a part of this human race that I am born, I live, and I will die. It is highly probable. You see how careful you have to be with inductive logic. So it was a tremendous improvement when during the Middle Ages, late part of Middle Ages, not on the continent, in Great Britain, where British people were always different, you know, <laughs> different, you know, from the Europeans, and, you know, they were skeptical and also religiously, you know, they were just very strange. And cuckoos, you know, <laughs> and they had a belief in senses, you know. Their belief in senses led them towards inductive logic. They were collectors, you know, British are great collectors, they collect everything. And so they collected, they collected uh, samples of gunpowder, you know, experimented with it and figure out that they have a better gunpowder and they use it against Spanish Armada. <laughs> you see, 
empirically. They made inventions, empirically inventions. And their philosophical belief to all generations up to 18th century of David Hume, which was formulated in form of a very short statement. There is nothing in human intellect what has not been prior in senses. You see, this is a formula. You don't get anything into your, your uh, uh, mind. Mind is a storage room. Five senses deliver everything what they collect, put it into the mind, and then you go into the storage room and you pull it out. There is nothing in human intellect what has not been prior in senses. Practically every British intellectual accepted this belief. An example, Isaac Newton, one of the greatest of the physicists. When he was sitting below his proverbial apple tree, <laughs> and I was there with my friend, we were sitting at the same place. It was the apple tree, probably fifth generation after that, you know. But the same apple tree, you know. And he's sitting, and the apple fell down on his head, made a bump. He said, gravity. This was Eureka. The whole world is gravitationally bound. Our Earth pulls down the apple. It was not intended by my earth to bump my head, you know. But everything has to fall down. You see, this was his Eureka. Out of that he created modern physics, which replaced Aristotle's physics and was regarded as physics of this world, and it will never be otherwise. And you know what he said? He said in Latin, in order to, so that it sounds noble. <laughs> he says, hypothesis non fingo. I do not pretend that this is a hypothesis. This is the real stuff of this world. I, my Eureka, just pull it out. He was mistaken, too. <laughs> so, the great Newton was child of his nation, child of the British belief, and he announced it to the world, and the world accepted it for almost next 300 years up to the time of uh, Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg. They created again a new physics which rests on assumptions. They would have never dared to say hypothesis non fingo. You, know, you, you must be in science a pretty big fool, you know, who, who dare to say nowadays hypothesis non fingo. You know. All fanatics, you know, Marxist fanatics, all Religious fanatics believe that it is their belief is not hypothesis. And if you would dare to tell them, just be careful. Don't don't they do don't do it. Now to <laughs> close the story. Uh, it was John Locke who 
uh, is pope of this empiricism, British empiricism, and who just summarizes it the way as I stated. There is nothing in human intellect what has not been prior in senses. About 2,000 miles on European continent, there was another brilliant man at the, at the same time, Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz, who was frequent visitor of London, uh, when he heard John Locke's formulation, he was a polite man, a brilliant man, also polite. So he answered uh, John Locke. He says, Mr. Locke, how true you are. There is indeed nothing in human intellect what has not been prior in senses, let me add something, with the exception of the intellect. The exception? With the exception of the intellect. So Leibniz added to this formulation of John Locke that he agrees that there is nothing in the intellect, with the exception of the intellect. It is the intellect which turns everything around, you know. No, he was riding the rationalistic horse, you know, European uh, rationalistic horse and enjoying it, you know. And <laughs> so British did not give any great role to, to intellect, you know. Senses were everything. So this is a traditional conflict which uh, moves through the modern history. Conflict between deduction and induction between a rationalism of the continent, which has all other theories connected, and empirical in Great Britain. If you are born, and it can tell you something, what are we? How, where are we coming from? From British sources. Our tradition, American tradition, is traditions which was built on British foundation, <coughs> empirical foundation. When we educate, we will educate this empirical foundation, but we will add to it. We will not add what Leibniz did, intellect. We will add praxis. Everything what is winning is the case. So empiricism reinforced in America is pragmatism. <coughs> Everything what works is true. You see this is an extension of empiricism emphasizing Pragma, praxis. So we will emphasize in our educational method praxis. What is not practical doesn't make sense, you know. This is what President Patty told me when I came here in 1960, when I wanted to teach philosophy, he started laughing. And, he asked me if I can do something that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I was kind of president of the university. He's asking, uh, President Patty, what do you understand as making sense? <laughs> Nowadays, you know, in post era, we need people who can teach uh, so that we can catch up with Russians. We can teach Russian, German languages. No. no, I speak Russian. He called a, a Russian guy to examine me. German guy. You have a job, 7,100 for nine months. Will you take it? Yes, I'm glad to have a job. I forget your damn philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he told me. So, this was my encounter, you know, with the extension of British empiricism in Alaska.
Yeah. Don't be surprised. He was a mining engineer. Uh, and he was discussing what he knew very well. And he gave me credit that I can get a job if I will teach German and Russian. For two years, I taught German and Russian. In the meantime, I started working clandestinely, you know, <laughs> uh, or organizing philosophy under new president, President Wood, who did not like my philosophy. He, he at the very beginning, accused me that I don't teach religion. And he told me, I understand you are coming from a communist country. <laughs> but but uh, we have enough reverence here in town <laughs> who can help you to teach comparative religion. <laughs> and so I, this was the condition that I will introduce comparative religion. I told him it is not part of philosophy. I know you are coming from this communist country. <laughs> and, and, but this was his condition that uh, in America you have to have in colleges comparative religion. I didn't know how to teach it. I offered him to teach philosophy of religion. He examined it with somebody. He says, no, this is very dangerous. He cannot teach philosophy of religion, comparative religion. So I, I never taught comparative religion. <laughs> <laughs> then he gave me other conditions. You don't have enough books on philosophy. The library, how could you start a department without books? So this was a condition. I mentioned it to my friend, Jay Rabinowitz. Many of you know him. That I, I don't have enough books. Within 24 hours, I had a check from his father in New York for $5,000 to buy books on philosophy. This was not enough. I contacted German consulate, and they gave me books, whatever I wrote down that I need. But then I was told it is in German. Nobody can read it in German. But there were books. I said, you know, you ask me for number of books. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the last condition was, that I don't have enough books. And I met a librarian who was my good friend. He learned a, a, about my travail, and he said, come, I tell you something. The, the most departments at the university don't order books from their budget. It is on their budget, but they are not interested in books. Can you do something with it? So I was ordering books on philosophy on their budgets, the budget of the <laughs> Department of Geology. <laughs> about 15 departments. I wrote, ordered books for about $10,000 because they would have never used it. And they didn't know about it. So it doesn't hurt if you. If you, <laughs> if you <laughs> And later, Dr. Wood found out about it. <laughs> and, uh, but he was embarrassed to, to make it public, to admit that there are departments at the university which don't order books. <laughs> so I had him under control, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were good friends, but we were fighting most of the time. But, it was different from President Patty. All modern breakthroughs, as you know, came by people who followed uh, Leibniz, intellect. 
when Einstein formulated his special theory of relativity and later uh, general theory of relativity. He did not say hypothesis non fingo. He says, go and try to confirm it. Hundreds of physicists were trying to have eurekas how to confirm that it is indeed the case. One of them was Professor Eddington, who was able to confirm theory of relativity during the solar eclipse. So it was not up to Einstein, you know, to push his theory, you know, convince people. He said, no, play with it. Go and tell me if it is the case. It was the case. So all others, you know. So people who introduced these uh, new ideas, the ideas came from Eureka's. What is the Eureka? It is difficult to describe it. It is kind of orgasm of the mind. You cannot prepare. You cannot mix it, uh, prepare it, that it will come. You know, I've been teaching it for 50 years, and there is a uh, few of the students heard this story before. When I taught about, about how to create, I was using a German philo other German philosopher, Husserl, Husserl, philosopher of mathematician of second half of 19th century, uh, who died around 1930. He is the first one who tried to penetrate into the nature of Eureka. What he suggested was against everything Western men believed, deduction or induction. He was exposed to teaching of a brilliant Dominican priest in Vienna uh, Brentano. Franz Brentano was excommunicated Dominican priest. Um, he introduced into 19th century, later part of 19th century, Western thinking idea of St. Augustine. And St. Augustine next to as probably some of you know, in his young years, he was a great lover of women. And later he changed his mind, probably he had enough, maybe it was a result of some diseases he was able to get. <laughs> and and he, he joined the movement of Christianity. He became a bishop of Nippo and, and a great Christian philosopher. He, among other things, he introduced Platonism as a foundation of early Christianity. Dualistic world of Plato became dualistic world of early Christianity. Among other things, he, he produced a revolutionary idea against tradition of Aristotle and Plato as far as human mind is concerned, which was described as rationalistic, deductive, inductive, he created a teaching that human mind, in order to do something, has to have an intention to do something. And this very intention slices the world of possibilities into 
that intention and everything has to go. So human mind is intentional mind. And this intention can be directed towards one thing only. You cannot be scatterbrained, you know, with intention, you know, towards everything. <coughs> so human mind is intentional. This is around 5th century AD, 19th century, Franz Brentano is introducing it into modern philosophy and psychology. Psychology started paying attention to it. That human mind has to be directed towards a target. When you shoot a target, you shoot that target, not that target, not that target. This very idea of intentionality of human mind was brought by Husserl, who was his student. He studied mathematics, and next to mathematics, he studied under Professor Brentano. Out of that, you know, he created a powerful school called phenomenology. Phenomenology. And here, using the method of, of St. Augustine, he introduced conditions which must be present in order for the mind to have potentially a eureka. In order to achieve it, you have to bracket, he used the word bracket, bracket the mind, setting aside everything what you have learned in your life. All the books you have studied, all degrees you have, your intentional mind has a problem. You conceive a problem, but you don't go into what Aristotle said about it or Newton said about it. You know, you have a problem you want to solve. A physician encounters in his diagnosis something unique. He has Eureka, this is, I never read anything about it. Of course there is nothing. And I will, he starts concentrating on that very problem. The problem is your baby. So you don't use anybody's what he said before. You bracket your mind from your subjective approach, I don't like it, I, you know. You just clean your mind towards this very problem you want to solve, and then wait. Whenever I was teaching for 50 years, students loved it, this method. They learn it very fast. <laughs> during, during the final exam, they came and they said, Professor Krejci, nothing happened. <laughs> not, not, nothing happened. You know, this method doesn't say that it, you have to be productive. In 99% of cases, nothing really happens. But students use it, you know, when they say, <laughs> no, 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 I agree, I, 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 I see, I see, and really nothing happened. <laughs> Of course, this is beyond great, you know. <laughs> yeah, how can you grade somebody? <laughs> so, so this is Edmund Husserl, who creates conditions for the mind to concentrate on the problem you conceive in anything, in mathematics, science, uh, anything. You isolate yourself and clean your mind. 
you are waiting for orgasm. Nothing happens. Nothing. You, you try tomorrow again. The day after tomorrow again. I conclude with Einstein. When Einstein learned about this method, when he was clerk in Bern, in Switzerland, he says, how do you spell it? Phenomenology. What is he, what is he saying there? It was explained to him. He said, I always walk like this. <laughs> uh, now I have a word for it, but I walk like this in always. This is the way how I walk. You know, I start all over again. <laughs> always with a blank page of paper. And And then uh, the, the last one also, uh, which happened in a classroom. I was describing Einstein in cases like this. And I said that every man or woman who have one great idea in their lifetime have to be very happy one great Eureka. And there was quiet in the class. And I said, Einstein is probably the only one who had one and a half. <laughs> what was the half? <laughs> no, general theory, you know, in the, uh, unified field theory, which was his half idea. They were meeting together with Bohr for 30 years. Niels Bohr from Copenhagen, Einstein from Princeton before, before he moved to Princeton. They were meeting and Bohr was a heavy smoker. So very often in their little room, there was no, nobody was able to see that there were two men arguing. <laughs> you, know, you know, what they argued was, whether God plays dice with the universe or not. <laughs> For 30 years, can you imagine <laughs> two people are arguing whether God plays dice with the universe? And so I, I dare to say the class, they did not solve the problem, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> how, how, how did you, how did you? On, you know, when they met last time, you know, before Bohr died and Einstein died, the last meeting was, I think Einstein had a splendid idea. Look, for 30 years we are fighting here, you know, whether God plays dice with the universe. Why don't we call him? He said, oh. and Bohr nervously started dialing. Zero, quote, Zero, 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 zero. And now they were fighting for the, uh, for the phone. On the other side, a secretary of God left it and asked, what can I do for you, young man? So they tried to explain her if God could tell them whether he plays dice with the universe. And she said, God is not here. Where is he? Where is he? He's on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after all this great work he has done, this is his first vacation he's taking. When is he due back? No, you know, young man, in a couple millennia, <laughs> Don't call him, he will call you when he comes back. And so we are waiting for the call. <laughs> so, so, and we will be waiting probably <laughs> because this is a puzzle produced by Eureka of quantum mechanics. So, amen. <laughs> so next time we will continue.